This is the Western Obsessions TV podcast, where hunting's not a hobby, it's an obsession. This podcast is brought to you by Top Predator, a fitness archery challenge. Do you have what it takes to be the top predator? All right, welcome, welcome, welcome. To, this is the Western Obsessions TV podcast. And this episode, I have my man Luke on here. Luke owns Meat Cleaver. He is a butcher. He owns the butcher shop down in um, Denver. And he's the guy that I take all my meat to. What's up, Lou? Hey, I'm excited doing? to be here. Good, dude. Um, I was just, uh, we were just chatting a little bit and we're, we're, we just recorded our, or filmed a video of you cutting up an elk and um, I'm going through the edit right now. And like, I just realized how much I've screwed up on like a whole bunch of shit. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and don't worry, I'm only like six hours into the edit and the, it's like an hour long so far. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. But I tell guys, man, Hey, as long as you are like engaged in your food chain, right. Um, you can't screw it up. You know, you might have a little extra going to the grind, but we're all about guys who are just stoked on their food and, and hunting. So, um, yeah, never be afraid to dive in like that. I know you've done a little bit of that. Yeah, man. And, uh, and that's what we're going over today. So like, like I said, Luke owns the, uh, the meat cleaver downtown Denver and, you know, just to give some hunters some background on like what it takes to process meat and what these guys do day in, day out. And, you know, Luke's got an interesting angle and a, uh, kind of story here on, on, uh, preparing meat, man. And I, you know, I was down the other day and we were visiting. I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed learning more about like what to do in the field, what to do after I get the meat home and stuff like that. So how's the day going, man? You said that no one's died there yet. So that's a good day. <laughs> uh, some days it's a little up in the air, uh, here at the, the meat cleaver chasing cows and, uh, running around with sharp things, but. Um, we do have a good time doing it for sure. Right on, man. All right, let's jump into some questions I got here for you, man. Like you're a hunter, right? Like you just don't cut up meat. You hunt yourself. Well, I'm, I'm under the philosophy of first legal animal. Um, and so, yeah, when I can get out, I try to pull the trigger as quick as I can. Um, it's a big lie working in the hunting industry, man. You, you can't hunt anymore. You know, game season is, uh, is my busiest time of the year. So no, but I definitely get out and, and that's my background kind of into this world is um, growing up hunting in New Mexico and, and experiencing wildlife and wild landscapes. That's, that's really my passion. Um, yeah, you made a good point, man. Like you're in this industry now. So hunting season is probably one of your busiest times in the shop there. And how do you get out and go hunt? Well, right, right now I am um, mid, uh, game plan for kind of my next application year for a couple different states and so i got my excel spreadsheets out and i am weighing my odds on real early season or real late season stuff so um like this year i got out on my uh, archery over the counter elk tag here in colorado uh the first week of september um got into some bulls didn't end up throwing an arrow but it was a great time and i just got back from a little texas whitetail and javelina hunt Dude, how'd that go, man? It was Tell fun. Me about it. You know, totally different culture of hunting than I've ever really experienced. Um, my pops grew up in Texas, and actually his dad um, went to high school with a good hunting buddy. And so for the past three generations, we've had kind of an annual hog toss we do out there every year. Um, which morphed into a couple of us going down and, and chasing whitetails for a long weekend. Yeah. Do you bring that hog back and butcher yourself? Uh, I did. Yeah. Uh, TSA gave me the, uh, the look of shame when they saw that I had a deer and a javelina stuffed into my uh, uh, Kafaru <laughs> pack <laughs> that I was checking. So um, I got through TSA. All right. And I actually just cut it up. I should have, I should have sent you the picture. I did some, cool stuff with it um, so it was it was really fun i was taking some meat back from hawaii last year i went on an axis deer hunt and of course axis deer man I, you have to bring that meat back that's like one of the best meat to eat and um i put it in a cooler it was all frozen i taped the cooler shut and it got checked just like a normal bag and yeah. i think you know i let them know what was in there but as it's coming out on the carousel and like where all the other bags are at the tape had broken loose and it came out upside down Yes. And just meat, frozen meat, 
was <laughs> everywhere on the carousel. And I had the looks, man. People are looking at me. I'm scrambling to pick up all this meat off the <laughs> airport carousel. And people are like just staring, man. It was crazy. No, that's the best. I think it, it is really not that hard to fly with meat. And I think guys are a little intimidated to do it. But I mean, really, you can, you can check meat just like you did. I mean, I had this was probably bad, but we went back to a hotel the last night. We we're going to fly out early the next morning. And I had all my deboned meat in these big, like poly bag sacks. And I just loaded them in the uh, hotel bathtub and threw like 50 pounds of ice all over it. And so it, it wasn't even hard froze and I flew with it, but they, they let me slip through with that. Yeah, man. You know, keep it under temperature, then you get up over 10,000 feet and it stays pretty cold up there too. Yeah, it's pretty frosty up there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what'd you get in Texas? So you got a, a, a hog and a whitetail. What, what kind of, I mean, was it a, a buck, doe? Or yeah, what? so um, I've, I've shot one doe whitetail out in Maryland um, uh, a couple of years ago. I a buddy who's from out there and um, man, that's an interesting hunting world too. We were like, urban hunting like folks backyards and like that's little cool city ranches or you know kind of ranchettes things and um but yeah first whitetail buck i i think to be considered a man on this earth that's one i need to uh mark off eventually right so um we kind of planned this hunt over the past couple of months and um uh decent sized property down in south texas um lots of mesquite kind of just lowland flat land you know, looking over, um, you know, big cuts and I forget what they call them. And they cut out big strips in that like mesquite brush country. Mm, just like um, lanes, right? Like almost like roads. Yeah. Like, it's right? like, yeah, almost like a, they almost look like a two track under a telephone pole, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but they'll rip a bunch of those through a property, um, you know, for natural gas stuff or for hunting stuff or whatever. And you just kind of sit on crossroads and before you go out in the morning, you just toss corn down each lane um, and cross your fingers from there. Yeah. It's definitely a different hunting experience. Like uh, I'm assuming you grew up mid, like Western hunting, right? Yeah, Elf, definitely. I mean, deer. And seriously, I couldn't be more grateful um, for being from New Mexico with all the public land access and um, especially like they have a really strong kind of youth tag program. And I think especially in New Mexico. Um, so just a lot of hunting opportunity. I mean, from, you know, Southern Rockies and Northern New Mexico, elk, mule deer, lion, bear, you know, down over into the plains and Eastern Colorado, right. And lots of antelope. There's even some white tails running around out there if you uh, go far enough, but you know, down south into kind of this high desert country and, and then way down south, you know, down even in the boot heel chasing coos deer, javelina, ibex, uh, oryx is a little more central, but um, yeah, just growing up and getting out of school, I had some great opportunities um, to chase a little bit of everything in a lot yeah. of different landscapes. So um, super fun those, those are some new mexico specials you're looking at behind me oh nice man yeah. so how'd you get into hunting was that like the traditional or just you, you let, let me know how'd you get into hunting yeah like very very paternal uh lineage there um and hunting my dad grew up in texas moved around uh school for a while ended up in colorado going to csu to finish up his degree and um he was about to marry my mom, decided it was a better idea to run off into the mountains and be an elk guide for a season. Um, <laughs> and so that was kind of our, our family story start of hunting in the West and, um, you know, settling down in Albuquerque and exploring New Mexico. So that's kind of where I come from, from a, a hunting lineage, if you will. Yep. Right on. And I think that's where a lot of hunters come from. It's just passed down from parents and uh, fathers or whoever, whoever, hunted. you know, my mom actually hunted a lot. And I, I took her on her first elk hunt this year and awesome. uh, oh my God, we filmed it. It's up on our show, but like, it was, it was an amazing experience. Um, all right, let's, let's, let's uh, turn the page here a little bit. Let's, let's get into meat, man. That's your expertise. I know that's what people really would want to learn more about. Let's start with it. Like in the field, you just killed an animal, deer, hog, javelina, elk, mute, whatever it is. All right, let's yeah. talk about like meat care and what you would want to well, see like a hunter do. 
Yeah, well, we need to do some serious prefacing um, of kind of just the perspective I come from when I take a look at meat, right? Um, I'm a hunter. I'm not a meat scientist. I don't have a formal background in cutting meat. Um, you know, r really like industry-wise, the meat cleaver and a couple old salty meat cutters uh, taught me everything I know. And so whatever I learn um, about how we handle meat, how we look at food safety, how we look at field care, that's all through the perspective of a hunter. Um, I hope that's a huge asset to our customers um, and our community, um, but I'll leave, the, uh, um, I'll leave the textbook work to the boys up at the university and, and big ag, you know, and, and really an I've asset. gotten, so oh I, yeah, I, definitely. I think it's an asset. I'm a hunter, you're a hunter. Like I know me bringing my product to you, my game to you is like, feel like we speak the same language you know and i think it's i think it's the same i think it's a great asset that that's your background so sorry yeah. sorry keep going and i've also had i mean i've also had some great folks um you know kind of in the the meat industry world a little more of, of that end of things um take me under their wing and um, kind of show me the ropes in some ways about how we handle food as a people um, and how industry handles food and i think that those have been just huge assets to our business um, you know, as, as we are stewards of the hunter's food product. Um, yeah, but I mean, it boils down uh, in a lot of ways uh, to kind of the, I call them the three main pillars of, of wild game, right? We got hunters in the field with field care. Uh, the butcher, that's my department, right? Making big pieces of meat into little pieces of meat. Um, <laughs> and then the cook, right? And if any of those team members are slacking, um, everybody else hears about it and dinner isn't quite as tasty as it could be. Um, so yeah, I think let's dive into the hunting side of it, the field care side of it. Yeah. Um, would be a perfect place to start. Right. And so like, it, as far as my knowledge, before I started hanging with you down to shop, you know, it was, okay, let's get the, let's get it under temp. Let's get it cool as fast as we can. Let's keep it clean. Keep the dirt, the, uh, the hair, the blue paint off the meat where I was in there the other day. And he's like, there's literally blue paint all over the silk. <laughs> so I'm like, keep again, the He was a super nice guy. Right. But he's yeah. like a, he's some sort of contractor, you know, he pulls up and is, you know, it looks like a kind of an electrician truck kind of thing, you know, with all the storage and all this crap. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. dude, what is this on your elk? And he's like, Oh, I got a little blue paint rolling around in the back of my truck. And I'm just like, <laughs> hitting myself on the head you know um oh my gosh but yeah i i, I like what you said and it's something we've talked about before um uh, you know as we take a look at the process um from the shot um i think that the and we can break this down in a few different time zones if you will but i think the time from the shot to the gutting and skinning process may be the most important step when it comes to field care and hunter stewardship. Um, the longer an animal is over temp, right? Kind of a vague term there, but as long as an animal is over, let's just call it 40 degrees, that meat, um, that meat is spoiling, right? Um, and the longer that happens, right? You can't, unspoiled meat it's a it's a one-way downhill curve we can slow that process um but it, it's a it's a game of speed you know for example when meat is in the freezer it's still spoiling right it's still breaking down it's just doing that at a really slow pace um you know you can't keep meat in a freezer for 10 years for example right it's gonna spoil eventually Right. That's a good point. Um, yeah. But the factors that spoil meat, right, that heat um, work at a much faster rate um, when the animal has a bullet or an arrow in it and no one's touching that animal. Um, and so as hunters, right, um, it's a fine balance, right, as we all know of, hey, not pushing an animal, giving it time to um, expire, to bed down, Right. And, and this goes into so much context, as we all know, right? How good is the shot? How far is the shot? What'd you see? The blood on the ground? I mean, there's a million different things we can talk about there. Um, but 
for example, leaving an animal overnight and finding it in the morning. Oh man. I, <clears throat> when a guy comes in and loads his deer or elk up, you know, I, we can see pretty clearly, um, you know, Hey, did you leave this overnight? And the answer is typically yes. Um, you know, from a, either a texture or a color or a smell perspective. Um, and again, that's kind of a sliding scale, right? Meat can be um, a little beat up, kept hot a little too long and still be okay as it goes through the process, right? Still be a, an edible and a safe food product. Um, but there's a, there's a very fine tipping point into, you know, spoiling animals. So, right, as quick as we can get to that animal um, as hunters, the better that's going to um, treat us throughout the rest of the process for sure. Right. I actually had a, a situation, I think it was two years ago, I shot a whitetail buck and it was kind of a bad shot. Not terrible, but like enough where I was like, if I go and it just got dark, just getting dark, you know, shot him a few minutes before dark. If I go in, I think I'm going to push him. I'm going to let him sit overnight and I let him sit overnight, found him the next morning, skimmed him out, got the meat down, you know, and he was pretty stiff when I found him already. And so threw them in the cooler, threw some ice on it, head back to Colorado, which was like a five hour drive. By the time I got back to Colorado, that meat had spoiled so bad. It was like rancid yeah. as I opened up that cooler. And it was, and just, it's always a heartbreak, right? Like oh my we, God. we never want it to happen. We don't want to see it here at the shop. We don't want to see it for hunters. I don't want to see it when I'm going out and hunting you know, uh, but man, it, it's part of the game we play. It is. Um, but I think as responsible hunters, um, there are some actions we can take, um, you know, right. We, we have things in our control and out of our control. Um, and we just need to make sure that we manage things in our control wisely. Um, right. you know, for example, when we make a shot, when we start looking for an animal, um, you know, Hey, do we sit there for two hours and take Instagram pictures or do we get that thing gutted out, get that meat cooled down? You know, um, I mean, these are very real things that, that hunters deal with. Right. Oh yeah. Uh, and they need to make, especially on my side when I'm filming a, a hunting show is, all right, we got the kill. We got the animal down. We come up, we got to get footage, footage of the animal, the, the shots, like, and I'm scrambling to get the, as much footage as I can get because I know I want to get that height off the meat and get it cooled down as fast as possible. But Absolutely. I still got, I still have to get the footage, you know. So uh, yeah. there's, there's definitely that balance. Um, so, all right, here's, the, here's a controversial question for you. I'm curious to see what your opinion is. I have my own opinion on it, but I'll let you go first. All right, one, adrenaline of the animal. Does that change the meat and, and the taste of the meat, do you think, and the age of the animal? Does that change? Yeah, uh, those are those are great questions. And again, we can go down as many rabbit holes as we want. <laughs> I know it's, it's a bit controversial. I mean, there's there's both sides there. So I just want to know what your opinion is, Luke. Yeah. Um, well, and and before this totally slips my mind, I want to throw in one more thing on uh, you know between the shot and finding the animal. I want you to imagine an elk laying there on the ground as a big bucket of potato salad like that nice, dense, like old school Southern potato salad. I'm with like you. just I'm imagine like your meat sitting in the sun like it's a potato salad, right? Like baby, the clock's ticking. It's, it's ticking quick, you know? Um, and I think if folks have a good visual on like, oh crap, you know, I need to get over there because the, the clock's ticking. I think that will help folks make good decisions in the field, you know, overall. Um, mm -hmm. But right. You mentioned age of animal and adrenaline. Yeah. Um, two great questions, right? Um, we'll compare this to our meat industry as a whole, what we do on a commercial level, and it will give some good rules of thumb um, as we tackle these two things. Right. So <laughs> um, let's handle first adrenaline. Any stress that an animal is under um, is going to, it's never going to increase meat quality. How about that, right? Um, 
it, it's only going to decrease um, food quality. Now, I break it down like this. Is it the shot? Is it that that bull's been running for the past month and doesn't have a lick of body fat on him? He's been fighting and scrounging and not sleeping and chasing cows for the past 30 days, right? That's a stressor that's out of the hunter's control. Absolutely. Um, you know, going back to shot, was it one shot? Was it two shot? Was it a good shot? Bad shot? You know, how long is that trail? All these things. And, and really going back to factors that are in our control or out of our control, it, those are good questions to ask, right? Um, you know, did that mule deer just kick off a mountain lion the day before, you know, off his back legs and he's been running three counties over till the spot you just found him on? Lord knows, right? Um, and so I think animals, especially in the wild game world, um, have so many natural stressors compared to our domestic livestock chain, right? You know, you got a beef sitting in a pasture or a feedlot for a year and a half who doesn't think twice about anything all day long. And then at the last moment, um, you know, it's loaded up into a trailer, driven 100 miles and put in a new environment they're not familiar with, right? I, I see kind of different um, stress patterns among those two things, different life stories or life histories there. Um, and so I don't know if I have a solid answer for you on that. You're um, sure tiptoeing the hell around in this question right now, Luke. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, more stress equals lower meat quality. In a story, right? In a story. Oh, but I, I, think, I think there are some good questions to ask um, as we think about what we're really doing out there and, and the animals we're chasing. Um, I will say, um, I think that heat and dropping heat quick off, off an animal is going to play a much larger factor than in stressors when it comes to meat quality. I'll, I'll definitely stand by that. Um, I'm with you on that one too. I yeah. think that matters way more than whether or not, you know, that, uh, animal ran an extra 500 yards or something after your shot or cause you can't control, you don't know what the animal has been doing before you shoot for the most part. You maybe watch them a little bit, but like, like you said, has, has that bull been rutting and dropped massive body fat, you know, same thing with a white tail, right? Like you, you can't control that, but I don't think it matters a whole lot after that shot. Like how much adrenaline, um, right? Like you said, if it's under stress, the quality will never go up. It, probably will go down exactly. but i think it matters more how long has that meat been sitting with heat Huge. and how f fast you can get that cool cooled down yeah. that's a bigger factor and variable that's my opinion on it yeah. my opinion on mm -hmm. the age now i'll let you go first age okay. of an animal all right what do you think is that really determine the taste of it uh yeah. younger animals are going to be more tender and um, that's just kind of a good rule of thumb um, in general, I think we can pull kind of some data points from a lot of different places. Um, you know, just take a look at like veal, right? Um, you know, it's known for tenderness. It's a beef under, I think it has to be under five months to be considered veal, whatever. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, a calf elk compared to a big old nasty rutten bull, um, that calf is probably going to be more tender. Um, I would say as a general rule of thumb, um, but really, I think if you, if you did a Pepsi challenge between, you know, a three and a half year old cow and a nine year old cow, gosh, I, I really don't know if you can tell the difference. Um, you know, we get a pretty good sample size in here. And uh, I, I, I think lots of hunters will be glad to hear, I don't get to eat any of the product around here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, but just looking at meat from a texture standpoint and a color standpoint, I mean, I think we have a pretty good sample size that comes through here. Um, you know, maybe a six month old elk calf compared to a nine year old, you know, elk cow. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. I, I, I could see that. Sure. Um, sure. So, uh, another one I hear a lot about is, uh, diet, which we can go into that. That's next for sure. After we hear your thoughts on the yeah. age thing. I, here's my opinion, man, is, and this is just from my experiences. I have not seen any different 
from a three-year-old animal to a seven-year-old animal, you know, yeah. and I've heard that a lot. Oh man, you killed a, a big old white tail buck that's been rutting or a big old bull. He's not going to taste as well as that like raghorn. I haven't, I really have not seen a difference. Yeah. All. I call, I call dog crap on a lot of that. You know, yeah. you know, I think if I were just to put a number to it, um, 12 months, right. You might be able to tell a difference between something under 12 and over 12. But I think once you get over 12, it's pretty darn synonymous. Uh, that would, that would be my yeah. kind of interpretation, you know? Yeah, I agree with you. Okay. Now diet. What has that animal been eating? Here's, here's my perspective. Oh, on it. Kills, kills, if, kills. If, it, if it's been living on the, a type of food its entire life, cool. That might taste something different. But if it's changed its diet within the last couple of months is eating something different, I don't think that really affects the flavor at all. So like, yeah. you know, you get an animal that's been living on sage forever. Since Dude, don't, even, don't even say it. Don't even don't say even. it. <laughs> oh my gosh i don't even know if, i don't even know if we should get into this um <laughs> <laughs> let's get into it man that's what this podcast is all about right so let's right something i love so much about hunters is is really how communal we are and how tribal we are and um how generational we are um but i think a lot of these one-liners a lot of these kind of old wives tales of of meat hunting um, can get just real skewed over time, right? That oh, buck sure. with even sagebrush, it's gonna taste like grind it all up into summer sausage, right? Whoa, whoa, you know, like let's back up here, right? Like, um, and again, right, uh, the customer is always right. And if folks are gonna use a food product, um, with, with a stewardship in mind, however they have it, um, that they're really gonna use daily and effectively and enjoy it i'm all about it right um but kind of some of these one-liners i just die a little bit inside when when hunters come in um i would say i think that the first thing we need to look at is fat content um fat is flavor in so many ways um a good example of this is bears right um the diet of a bear a high fat content animal or a pork, a high fat content animal, um, is really gonna, the diet is gonna affect how that tastes. Um, and I think that's, that's a common consensus among hunters. So like, so like if, uh, obviously fat can change the way that something tastes. So if an animal, let's say, let's go bears, right? Let's say a bear has been living on rotten fish, been washed up on a shoreline. That fat's gonna taste different than a bear living on berries off of a mountainside. Are yeah, absolutely. On that? Yeah, yeah and, and I would agree with that. Last year, um, uh, CPW added a bunch of uh, new bear tags, kind of additions to like, an elk or deer tag in a lot of units. And so last year was kind of the year of the bear for us. I mean, September, October, we cut so many bears, it wasn't even funny. Um, and they just buried wildly. I mean, just just like, how the meat looked, the fat content. Oh my gosh. I have never seen like a wider spread in, in food quality or product that's coming through the door. You know, you go take a look at a hundred antelope. Well, they're all going to weigh right at about 60 pounds and they're all going to look right about the exact same, you know, right. Um, more or less. Right. But um, one bear last year, I remember cutting off, a good three or four inch layer of back fat all the way down. I mean, monster bear, super heavy. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, just super fatty bear. But some bears, I mean, they look darn near as lean as um, elk and deer. I mean, seriously, like they can get that lean. Um, yeah. And so I have no idea what they were eating on. I have no idea where these guys were on, but I could definitely see a very wide variety of diet, you know, just in, in what the meat looked like. Right. Um, so so you, kinda... you would say, I'm just trying to uh, condense kind of what we're talking about here is yeah. as far as diet affecting the way an animal tastes, it, it would probably affect the animal more if that's a high fat animal. 
Exactly. And so when we go back to something like, I think deer are a good example of this, right? We'll find them. There's more variability in their diet, right? And Eastern Plains, corn fed whitetail compared to, uh, you know, um, high mountain, you know, spring grass fed deer compared to sagebrush flats deer, right? Um, they don't carry any fat. And if they do, it's typically trimmed off in the process, at least on our end. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we might get little bits and pieces in here and there, but um, most of the fat content off our wild game is trimmed off in the process. Um, and so what would carry the majority of that flavor isn't going to carry itself into the end product. Typically. I see what you're saying. Because there's no marbling. And I mean, no. not compared to like a beef. A beef has a ton of marbling. And, and, and game, what we're talking about, there's no marbling necessarily in the meat. Um, so there shouldn't be that much variation of flavor because of the fat. Unless you're eating a hog or a bear where there's bear fat. I've heard I've never had it. It's supposed to be a very good fat to eat. It's supposed to be very delicious. Yeah. Um, but unless you're eating one of those types of animals that's high fat and you eat that fat with the meat, you're not going to see hardly any difference in, because of diet. Is that yeah. the consensus? I, I, would, I would agree with that. Um, and what, what I just hate to see is like, um, as hunters, we not utilize our resource to its maximum capacity um, because of maybe like perceived or assumed um, factors that, that we might not see the full picture on. Right. So like, just like you just said, uh, okay, that antelope's been living on sage. So we better grind that because he's been eating sage for, right? He's going to taste like crap. So we better grind that up. That probably just makes you cringe, right? Yeah. And I, I mean, I got a, a group of other customers who were getting fist fights over those back straps, you know? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there's a stigma too. I mean, there's animals that have certain stigma. So we take oh, yeah. pronghorn or antelope, however you want to say that. There is a stigma there. Some people think they taste like crap. Other people absolutely love the meat. I, I fall on the, I really like antelope. I've had some really good antelope. So um, yeah, there's stigmas there too. It's like what animal is better. And with that being said, Luke, which leads me into my next question for you. What animal is your favorite animal, wild game animal to one to maybe butcher two to eat? Uh, great question. Um, I'll start at the bottom of the list. I okay. hate cutting bears and lions. Oh my gosh, they're just, it, it's such a mess, you know, they just, well, they throw a big kink in our process. Um, we will cut bears and lions if we get any in after ungulates. Um, that's just something that we do so there's no cross-contamination, right, on shared surfaces. Um, sure. So, you know, like the grinder head or the cut table or the saw, you know, we don't want folks to end up with trigonosis from eating their elk, right? Um, and so it's a pain in the butt on our end uh, to handle what we love it, you know, come down to the, drop off your bears and lions. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, the larger the animal is, um, I think the more enjoyable it is for me to cut. Uh, you know, on a pronghorn, you know, you might be kind of taking tight corners with your knife or even trimming, right? You'll have it, your knife's proportionally larger. And so you can't quite get your cuts as accurate. I don't know if that makes sense, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, but for example, a moose, well, man, you can break out that eight inch breaking knife and start taking big pieces off. And the trimming is really like large and satisfying. Um, and so I would say kind of the larger the animal, the more enjoyable it is to cut. Yeah, I uh, can see how that would be way more satisfying, cutting larger pieces of meat rather than like, you know, little, you know, the, the smaller game, smaller pieces of meat where you got to be a little, yeah. more, a little more picky, a little more meticulous on that small little. But you got this big old, big old bull elk or like a big old moose and you got these big hams and yeah, that'd yeah. be super satisfying. Sure. Absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I definitely say that to eat. Um, I mean, I really do. I, I love it all. I, I just, if it's wild game, I enjoy it inherently. Um, but I would probably say kind of some more special things, you know, just elk. I just love the mystique of elk. 
Um, I don't think it's uh, food quality per se. Um, I just love eating elk. I think it's so much fun. Um, it, it, I just get a feeling eating elk that I don't get eating deer for some reason. Call me crazy, but that's just me. I'm with you. Yeah. There is some, uh, yeah, there is some majesticness coming yeah. from like, okay, this elk, because elk are just badass, man. Wait, I think they're way more badass than, than a deer, right? Like you're bugling, you're packing that meat off and you're working hard for that meat too. So is there some satisfaction there? You get it all the way home or take it to the shop. So yeah, I'm with yeah. you. I think elk's super high on the list, but you know what? Like this may surprise you that I, I bring in front. I think it's even better than elk is Shoot. axis deer and fallow deer. I, yeah. killed a, <laughs> killed, I killed a fallow in Texas off a ranch just for fun. And man, that meat's great. And axis I'm going back in Hawaii. I'm going back to Hawaii here in April, but like that, those, that meat is just amazing, man. And it's super tender. Uh, the flavor's real mild, not gamey at all. The color of it is like an axe deer's color is almost more like a mountain lion. It's not as red. It's, and it's not as dark. Yeah, yeah definitely different. Yeah. But I, you know, I love my elk too. Like it, it's a pretty close second there, you know? Yeah. So. And I'll say maybe some one-offs. I, I've never tried axis or fallow, but that's definitely what I hear from guys is it's kind of on the mild side, just real, real mellow, if you will. Um, something that I love, uh, and my dad got the opportunity to hunt Oryx in New Mexico. And man, that was some slick meat right there. Uh, real light, real mild, just very, very palatable. Like just the kind of meat you can't screw up cooking. Like it's just going to be good anywhere, you know, Sure. you, you might be able to over cook your elk back straps a little bit um but man for some reason and maybe it was just the novelty of eating an oryx right um that that appeals to me so much but um i i thought it was a pretty outstanding yeah i have not had the pleasure of eating an oryx yet so i guess that now goes on my bucket list <laughs> there you go i like it you need to plan a hunt <laughs> yeah that would be great man all right cool so uh, all right now let's get in some nitty gritties because, uh, you, you know, you own, uh, the shop, the meat shop, and there's hunters like me that's had bad experiences with, with processing shops before in the, in the past. So I've started over the last five years doing my own processing, which means like super basic. Cause I don't have much equipment, right? I got a grinder and I got a knife and that's all I've got. And that's all I really need. So I cut up some rows to cut some steaks. I do some grind but I'm lazy and I don't want to do the fancy stuff. I don't want to do the sticks and the jerky. Like it's just a lot of work, man. But so I was really deprived of all the nice fancy stuff, man. Yeah. But I, you know, I got introduced to you through a mutual friend and I got, I came down and saw your shop and saw your process and I started taking my stuff to you, but let's talk about this bad stigma that processors have, man, that wild game processor have of like, you know, you take a game, you take your animal in and you don't get your animal out. You maybe you don't get the poundage that you should get out or, you know, let's talk about that, man. What do you think? Yeah, I would say, uh, starting that conversation with who, who is the meat cleaver and really what do we do? Right. Uh, every day we go out and make big pieces of meat into little pieces of meat. Um, it's not rocket science. Anyone can do it in their garage. They really can um but not not everyone wants to right um, and that's where we come in um and especially with specialty things and sausages and fun stuff like that 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 is a part of kind of a product mix that guys really enjoy um, and i think adds to their enjoyment um, of their wild game product and so i tell folks whatever piece of the process we can play for them it would really be our privilege right um we come to the table as hunters as outdoorsmen as conservationists um, as stewards of landscape and wildlife um, and we do that by making big pieces of meat and little pieces of meat. and folks can really have a, a product that they are proud to use that has ease of use um and so that, that they can effectively use it right um so that's kind of the heart we bring to the table as we take a look at why we're in business and really what we do. Um, I would say uh, customer communication is super key 
in our business. Um, communication and transparency, right? When someone opens their box at home, I want them to have a really good picture of what they're gonna see before they even open the box. Um, you know, one thing that I, sorry. One thing I really enjoyed when I met you is um, right off the bat, you're like, hey, come on inside and, and take a look at the operation. And you walk me through the whole floor. It was like, here's our, here's our process from, and here's how we track your animal. And here's a, you know, that was really eye-opening and enjoyable because that took away all that fear and doubt. Like, okay, I'm dropping off my animal. Who knows what I'm getting back? Am I getting back someone else's dirty animal? I mean, they didn't do the field care as well as I prepped. Because hunters, I mean, the hunters like, me and you take a lot of pride in their field, field cares, taking care of that meat and using all the meat. Like I want that exact same animal back that I prepped and dropped off. Right. And, and maybe it wasn't very good meat. Maybe like I let it set a long time. Well, I don't want someone else's good meat back. I want mine back. Like, you know, I feel bad about it. Right. So like, I want my animal back. Yeah. That's a two way street right there. You know, <laughs> it is a two way street. Um, and right. You saw our process and, um, we do two very intentional things here at the meat cleaver. Uh, we got a pot of coffee on every day we're open for business. Folks are always welcome in here um, just to be present and to hang out and to see what we do. Um, and we're super proud of it. And I try to take as many customers as I can um, into the cutting room and to see like, I mean, this is where knives are on meat folks. This is what happens right here. Um, this is our process. You know, here's a quick look into our tagging system, um, how we keep track of everything. Um, I would say kind of from an industry standard and in wild game, um, you're typically going to get your cuts back. You might be getting your grind back, and you're probably not getting your specialty drivers back, um, you know, from a batch versus individual perspective. Um, what we do here is we get in the doors an extremely inconsistent product, right? Um, a deboned elk compared to a whole bear, right? Um, so much variability in field care and prep and physically how it comes in the door, um, even to uh, cutting specs, right? Everyone wants something different. So our job is, is to get products from a high variability state to a very clean, predictable, consistent product. And each, each game shop is gonna approach that question a little bit differently. Um, and that's why some folks go to batch work, right? Um, uh, kind of an ease of use in that and being able to push a consistent product. Um, we have a, Mm -hmm. Let me pause you right there when you're talking about batch work, because there might be some listeners that don't fully understand what you're talking about, yeah. me being one of them. But I'm assuming what you're talking about is, all right, we have a whole bu bunch of specialty, meaning like sausage and jerky and, and yeah. stuff that, that uh, you guys need to make. Instead of using their actual animal, you throw in, or I'm not saying you, some processors may throw it all, different animals all together, make a big batch of specialty. And then divide out, okay, you get this much, you get this much, you get that much. That is correct. Not exactly. Yeah, so, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So what they'll do is they'll weigh an animal on their intake system, um, whatever that looks like for each shop. Um, they will have a customer order and they will set an expectation of what that customer is going to get back. Um, that animal will go into storage, usually a large cooler of some kind. Um, and then when it's time, that animal will be brought into the cutting room, be broken down, be ground up, whatever it is. Um, some folks will do a daily batch. So they might cut 15 deer in a day. And they'll have a list of, okay, this is what we need to make for the day. 30 pounds of treso, 15 pounds of hot sticks, 100 pounds of bratwurst, whatever it is. Um, do that breakdown, push that batch of specialty through, um, and then divvy it back out to those customers. Some folks also work on like a weekly batch system 
Um, I've even heard of guys doing monthly or whole season batches Holy where if, if you have the space to freeze 10,000 pounds of elk trim, deer trim, whatever it is, and you just have a running list of who needs what specialty items, um, that'll be thought out after the season, um, ground, mixed, and give it out to customers. Um, which it does, it does have some upsides, right? You're gonna get a more consistent product back, um, but it's not gonna be your product. Um, you get an average product back, meaning not average is like, okay, this is okay. Meaning like you get the average of everyone's game in there. So you get, so maybe people have some really good meat care. You have some people had a really bad meat care and you, everything's all mixed in. So you kind of get a nice average. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and I really hate saying this out loud um, because it gives some credit to folks who do batches. If, if I'm a company that does batch work and I get an ounce of spoiled meat in a hundred pound batch of jerky, whatever it is, that whole batch is going to be trash. It is. I, I, might, I might be exaggerating a little bit there, right? But if I have one bad animal in a batch of, hundreds of pounds all of that product is going to be ruined it really is and so i know that folks who do batch work are extremely careful that they're not putting in poor product uh, because they have bigger stakes at risk they really do than us right kurt you know if you bring me in uh a uh, half spoiled deer you know and i say okay fine you know let's bring it in um and you don't like your deer, you know, you, you're the only risk I have of a customer callback, right? Mm -hmm. um, compared to, you know, 50, 100 customers, whatever it is. Um, it's as oh. a pretty big gamble, I would say, mm -hmm. right? For the batch work guys. Huge like, gamble. A huge gamble, but obviously it, it could make things a lot easier for them. Or I'm sure it's a lot harder for you guys that are not doing batch work to do every animal individually. That's a lot more labor, uh, probably a lot more work, but I think it's the right way, man. And I think, I know that well, you believe that's the right way. Well, and let's break it down even further than that. It's not per animal. It's right. Per animal, per species, per order, per recipe, per poundage of recipe, per style of recipe. So, right. Ooh. I might have go Schmoe's elk, that um, it, it's Joe's elk. Um, he wanted breakfast sausage at 15 pounds in links, not bulk style, right? And so it, it really, I mean, it goes down to the ounce of meat um, on, on how we take care of folks' product. And you kind of saw our sausage filing system, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, which we're more than welcome to get into. Um, but yeah, we'll mix it separately. We'll stuff it separately. We'll package it separately and we'll box it separately. And so it's all its own enchilada, uh, which I think guys really enjoy. And I think that goes back to us wanting to be hunters before we're meat processors, you know? Yeah. I would say that's you guys being hunters before businessmen. Right. Um, and, and I don't say that in a negative way. I think that, and let me back up a little bit, is by that customer care, that customer service, you're being a better businessman, but like you're not looking at numbers, right? You're looking at, okay, what's the right thing to do? And, and, uh, and that's the, why the reason why I'll continue to bring you my game. And now I don't have to sit at home and have my wife get all pissed because I got the kitchen table all bloody because I'm cutting up my own. <laughs> So, uh, but I, st I do still enjoy kind of doing my own thing back at home, but I will be bringing a lot more animals into you. So, um, but yeah, is that, is that right? Is that on kind of the, am I on the right track of like, um, the business? Yeah, no, I, I think it is. And, um, we're, we have a different process, right. Than I think a lot of game shops do. Um, that means our options are going to be a little bit different. Um, like our, our offerings, our product mix. Um, you know, some things like a minimum order, right? Um, if we're going to make um, hot sticks for somebody, 
whatever it is. Um, we need a certain amount of meat to work with just logistically in our machinery, right? Um, we deal with uh, product loss in our machinery, uh, yield stuff, and recipe volumes, right? You know, how much seasoning do we mix into um, an eight and a half pound order of hot sticks, right? There needs to be kind of some consistency um, in how we push product if we keep it separate throughout the process, um, or else it would just, I mean, you drop your elk off in November and we'd get it back to you in June. You know, if we had to crunch right. the numbers on every single little different um, recipe. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Hey, let's, I'm going to switch gears for us a little bit here. Okay. And that's, that was all great information, man. And then again, guys, that's, that's why I feel comfortable bringing my stuff into Luke. And I hope that if you don't live in the Denver metro area, you find a guy like Luke out there that will do that for you because it just eases your mind and what you get back. But let's bring some value to hunters out there that maybe you're new hunters that don't know how to do the field care. Uh, maybe you're um, veterans that might want some information on what can you do better or what might be nice to bring into the butcher for some different cuts that you've never had. So Luke, let's start. We talked a little bit about field care. I'm going to just kind of condense that conversation into get to your animal fast, get it cooled down and keep your meat clean. Is there anything else you would add to that? Uh, goodness. I mean, those are kind of the big, big cornerstones right there for sure. Um, I had what about water. I know some guys that like to, to cool off their meat would stick it into a stream and that seems like a oh, cool, it's cooling it off, but is that water doing damage? Um, Damage, not particularly. From a, from a food safety standpoint, minimal. Um, from a food quality standpoint, I would say, yeah, it's doing damage. Um, the cleaner, the cooler, and the drier we can keep the, the, the better the product we're going to have to work with. At the butcher shop and cooking, um, you know, getting everything back. Um, you'll, you guys will notice, right? Um, you know, if you leave your animal in shade, quartered up or whole or whatever, and nice and cool, and it has real good airflow, it'll start to develop a, a shell on it, right? Kind of a stiff outside um, sheet that, that really hardens up. That is awesome. Um, that doesn't just work as a bacteria barrier, but also like physical uh, contaminants, dirt, hair, you know, crap like that, blue paint, whatever it may be, um, <laughs> blue paint. right? That'll work as a physical barrier. Um, all of that typically comes off from the processing process anyway. Um, and so if it gets a little beat up in the truck bed or on the pack out, that's okay. Um, it, it's, a, it's a natural game bag, if you will, um, which is a good thing. But when we place product in water, uh, that does not develop. Um, mm -hmm. And... I think it bleeds out um, a lot of the color um, and it can even affect texture if placed in water long enough. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and color is kind of a uh, frivolous pursuit, right? It's more of an aesthetic pursuit. But, you know, if I'm cooking up my mother in law an elk backstrap, I want it to be red and bright and just kind of like rich, right? But if that backstrap's been hanging out in a cooler at elk camp for a week, sloshing around in the water, you know, I'm going to slap on the grill, kind of this pale, awkward, you know, uh, product. So Yeah, because we eat with our eyes first, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's you in our nose, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so all the, good things. The big takeaway for you guys I guess listening is that shells real important and how you get that is what Luke just said is by hanging it in the shade, letting air do it and letting that shell dry. Anything else you would add to that Luke? You know, um, not particularly right. Get it cooled off as quick as you can transport it as cool as you can. I would take dry ice or wet ice any day. Um, keep it in the largest pieces you can. Um, the more surface area that's on meat, the more we'll trim off and the lower your yield will be. 
I had a, I had a great customer interaction this year. He's like, this guy comes up to the dog. He goes, you know, Lucas, how, how do you want us to bring in our animal? And I go about five minutes after you shoot it, skin off and hold, right? <laughs> you know, but that's just, that's not hunting, right? That's not what we do. Um, and so the closer we can get it to that dream uh, butcher product, the, the merrier. So large pieces, uh, I do prefer bone in. Um, it's going to age better like that. You're going to typically have a higher yield, um, and as cool and as quick and as dry as you can get it in. Right. When I was in your shop sure. the other day, you were showing me some different cuts, bone in stuff. And you're like, man, if you could bring this back like this, and I think we're doing like the, the tomahawk steaks or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it was, but is there any things that you're like, man, if you could, if you could backpack this off, I know it's a little bit more weight. If you can get this into me, man, I could do some cool stuff. What would you say? Yeah, um, I would say at its most basic level, take all the scrap meat you can. If, if you are taking your quarters, back straps, and tenders, um, you're leaving a lot of weight, a lot of percentage in the field. Um, and we're talking about I, neck meat, rib meat, between the rib yeah. meat. We're talking about all yeah. that stuff, right? When I see when guys are dumping out their game bags, the little pieces of meat from between the ribs. Oh man, I just want to shake them and thank them. You know, um, we're going to have more options with grind with specialty product. You're going to have a higher yield um, and you won't be able to tell the difference after it's in the grinder. And so um, the more odds and ends you can bring in the merrier on our end, um, which is great. Um, a lot of guys like cutting ribs. Um, you know, they don't cook like a beef rib. Um, but you know, crock potting them, slow cooking them, peeling the meat off the bone, it, it's going to treat you well. Uh, so I think that's something that's typically underutilized. Um, and even kind of the brisket meat is some good volume, um, right? It's not like a beef brisket, it's real lean. Um, but yeah, neck meat as well. Uh, you know, even, right, we, we only offer boneless cuts. Um, just from a food safety standpoint from the state. Um, so that's kind of yeah. something we think about. Let's see here, and what do you want me to use? Rod of these guys for ground? Uh, and these guys? Sorry, guys, look like we got a little interruption here with Luke <laughs> and his employees. No, no one worries oh, yeah. there. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Business right. is sorry business. That. That's right, yeah. The meat shop never sleeps. Uh, I mean, yeah, it never sleeps. <laughs> it does. It does. It. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would say just any odds and ends folks can bring in the more options we're going to have down the road. So, um, don't be afraid to really dive in with your knife and spend an extra 20 minutes peeling stuff off. Yeah. And what's a couple more pounds in your pack over those five miles that you're packing out an elk, right? Yeah. I mean, like <laughs> that's why we do it. Anyway. Yeah. If, yeah. If, if your legs aren't screaming on the pack out, you didn't take enough meat off. my friend. <laughs> didn't know? take enough meat. Okay. That is right. All right, Luke. Hey, man, if, uh, you know, we're going to wrap up the, uh, this podcast here, but anything else that you want to give a shout out there or any other information you want to give some hunters or any maybe people thinking about hunting, harming their, their own meat before we wrap this up? Uh, get involved in any conservation organization uh, that supports hunting, angling, and public lands. Uh, we just met a whole bunch of boys down at the state capitol this afternoon. Um, to give the folks who wanted to ban lion hunting in Colorado a run for their money. Um, I think that went really well today. Uh, I couldn't stay for quite the whole thing. Um, but just great folks, whether it's the Colorado Bow Hunter Association, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation um, here in Colorado, um, Colorado Wildlife Federation. I mean, there's a lot of good guys doing a lot of good work out there. And if they don't have our support, um, this culture is going to change hunting and in the world we live in and it's not going to look the same. So for the sake of our opportunity and the opportunity of our kids, I mean, get involved, write emails to legislators and um, keep kind of up on the beat with um, what's going on in the conservation world. Um, and I would also say one more thing on top of that is, you know, new hunters or veteran hunters um, be open to getting real creative with your food. You know, 
I've seen that, uh, I, I mean, I'm not a cook, that's not my passion, but the more creative I get in the kitchen, um, really the more I enjoy my entire hunting process. I'm serious. Um, I just think that that end product we put in our mouths at the end of the day um, is just so much more rewarding and so much more enjoyable um, the more curious we get about it. Um, um, and so, yeah, don't be afraid to turn into old Betty Crocker with wild game. <laughs> It, it looks like we're going to have to do a, a cooking episode next huh? Yeah, no, I wouldn't mind. Well, you shouldn't talk to me about that because there's a lot, <laughs> there's much more uh, apt cooks uh, in the Denver area that can help me with that. But I'll, I'll cut the meat for them. How about that? There you go. You cut it, we'll have someone else cook it. Or hey, Luke, I appreciate it, man. And, and if you guys are uh, listening here or watching on the YouTube channel, Luke and I did a video where he went over and basically broke down it, how to debone your elk, all the cuts that you can make in the field or in your garage somewhere. And we went into some detail, definitely some good detail. I'm working on that video now. So that'll be up on the YouTube channel. And um, I really appreciate you spending time with us, Luke. And hopefully you guys learned something. And I hope you have a Luke in your area. I don't know if you can mail me. Maybe they can mail it across the state to you. We did. We had a customer who he likes our Italian sausage so much. He shipped us a deer from montana he shot and he's like dude i want the whole thing in italian sausages and i'm like you got it you know his shipping bill was more than the butcher bill which just killed me but oh yeah hey if well, he hey, likes it i'll i'll cut it for him maybe that's a new business model you can figure out how to ship this thing back but uh this was the western obsessions tv podcast thanks everyone for listening and have a great night this is the western obsessions tv podcast where hunting's not a hobby, it's an obsession.